It's interesting to me the number of scriptures I continue to come across that I've quoted and I've heard quoted for years like we all know exactly what they mean <clears throat> and we've said them so many times that of course we know they mean what we're saying when we say them but really it's like Judy Collins said about clouds I didn't really know what they meant at all Mark chapter 13 and verse 3 it's going to take a couple of moments to get to the scripture in question, but the background verses are really important to understand the verse I'm talking about. So Mark chapter 13, verse 3. And as he, Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives over near the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when are these things going to happen? What will be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? They wanted to know about the end of the age and his return. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed. You need to pay attention. Think about and prepare ahead of time so that you're ready, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come at my name, saying, I am Christ and they shall deceive many. I don't know if a lot of you are aware of this or not, but there are many, many churches out there and Christians in the world, in this country at least, who are looking for a revival, a revival before the return of Christ. They're looking for a religious fervor to sweep the country. And I really wonder sometimes if they aren't being set up for what Jesus is warning us about in this verse. Now that's not what I'm talking, that's not the crux of the conversation, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about. And, we sh and you when you shall hear war of wars and rumors of wars, don't be troubled, for these things have to happen, but the end shall not be yet. For nation is going to rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there's going to be earthquakes in different places. And there'll be famine, and hunger, and troubles of all sort. But these are only the beginning of sorrows. Now notice, <clears throat> through that section, there's no take heed. Because these are things you can't do a thing about. They're just going to happen. So get used to them and deal with it and go on. Verse 9. But take heed. There are those words again. Take heed to yourselves. Now remember, we're talking about the end of the age, preparing for something coming up, the return of Christ. For in the last days they shall deliver you up to councils, and in synagogues you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my name's sake, for a testimony against them. In the past, I would have read right past those words where it says you should be brought before the synagogues <clears throat> because I don't know of too many synagogues in Hopkinsville or too many synagogues in London, and I don't know of synagogues that wield a whole lot of political power. But you know the synagogues at the time of Jesus were like the churches of our day. And so, when Jesus says synagogues, we can think about the woke churches of our day. And now I've been taught all my church life <coughs> that trouble's going to come upon me, persecution's going to come upon me, because I keep the Sabbath. And you know that may well be. I wouldn't doubt it for a minute. We don't know what kind of obligations, what kind of demands the beast power and the false prophet will put upon us. But in the meantime, if you've not seen the documentary, The Enemies Within the Church, it's well worth your time to watch it just to see what's going on in Christianity out there. To understand what's happening 
to see how it might impact us no matter what day of the week we observe. Because the church and the world is going woke. And as the momentum grows, they are not going to be willing to put up with anybody who believes in the Jesus Christ of the Bible, who has any kind of biblical standards, no matter what day they worship on. So just more food for thought, but we're not quite there yet. Verse 9 again, So take heed to yourselves from the last days, they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the churches ye shall be beaten. You'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Verse 11. And when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand for what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate on what you'll say. But whatever you will be given in that hour, that speak you. For it is not you that's going to do the speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother shall betray brother, <clears throat> and father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. don't know if you're aware of all the um, protesting, demonstration prior to the Roe v. Wade decision coming down in front of the justices' homes. But as I read this, I thought about Justice Kavanaugh. He had some of the worst protesting in his neighborhood, on his home. And the news interviewed the neighbor and asked the neighbor what they thought about all this. And they were ecstatic because they had been the one to organize all the protest and all of the violence against Judge Kavanaugh. That was his neighbor. Verse 13. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Have you seen the hatred spewed out by the abortion supporters against Christianity, against Christians? By the LGBTQ community toward Christians, the Bible. By the COVID vaccinated toward those who refused the vaccine. There's all sorts of groups out there full of hate against somebody. And you should be hated of all men for my name's sake. But wait for it. Here is the quote I've so often heard and I've not really understood until I started to prepare this sermon. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. What are men and women capable of toward people they hate? Think Nazis and yellow stars. Think of the old South, the Jim Crow South. A Christian living in Saudi Arabia or the Middle East or one of the Muslim Asian countries. Can we really comprehend how it feels to be hated. When we look at the context of what Jesus says, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Jesus isn't talking about enduring so that we don't fall back into some sin pattern of the past. He's not talking about enduring <clears throat> so that we don't backslide as the good Baptist would tell us. He's talking about a whole different kind of enduring. Consider what the word endure means. These are from several editions of the Merriam-Webster for meaning of the word endure. To bear up, to sustain, to support without breaking or yielding, to force or pressure. Metals will endure a certain degree of heat without melting or a certain amount of weight without bending. It means to continue in the same state. To remain firm under suffering or misfortune without yielding. 
In Mark 13 and verse 13, Jesus is talking about enduring persecution and the life-threatening abuse that may come with it as, our, as a result of our allegiance to him. How often have we considered that kind of endurance? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. I want to look at three sets of scriptures here that all talk about things that could jeopardize our salvation. Two written by Paul and one by John. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 <clears throat> Know you not that the righteous shall not inherit or the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators nor adulterers nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, revilers, extortioners, none of them shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you repented, you were forgiven of your sins, you turned your life around, and now you are sanctified. And you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. <clears throat> now, one word there about endurance, because when we're talking about repenting of a sin and walking a different way, that's not what endurance is about. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Paul here to the Galatians basically repeats the same list. Galatians 5, 17, he says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit fights against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. <clears throat> but if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are clearly seen. And they are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, <clears throat> wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like of the which I'm telling you now and as I've also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Again, we may have to resist temptation. We may need to remain vigilant against sin. <coughs> but there's nothing here to endure, as in Mark 13. Revelation 21, verse 5. Now the list here is not as all-inclusive as the other two. It has a lot of the same things. But notice and see if you hear something you've not heard in the previous list. Something that stands out. <clears throat> something that you may say, wait a minute, that could be me. Revelation 21, verse 5. Here John's writing, he says, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, <clears throat> It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, <clears throat> the beginning and the end. <coughs> I shouldn't have stood so close to Sean earlier today. I think I caught it. The beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and they will be my sons and daughters. But the fearful and unbelieving, and the abominable murderers and whoremongers, sorcerers and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire, which is the second death. Did you hear the new one? There was not and could not be inferred from the other two lists. The fearful 
shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Have you ever been fearful? The idea of fearful is not mentioned by Paul. As we go forward, keep Mark 13, verses 12 and 13 in mind, with the idea of endurance and enduring to the end, and now add to it the idea of being fearful. Now, notice especially, this fearful is not the generic, I'm being afraid sometimes. <clears throat> I'm afraid of the coyote out there in the field and I walk to the barn. Or I'm afraid of the dentist when I'm going to go to the, see the dentist on Monday morning. Or I'm af if you're a young man, I'm afraid to pick the phone up and call this girl and ask her out because she might tell me no. No, this word for fearful is only used three times in the entire New Testament. And the other two times are when Christ and the disciples are in the boat in the storm and he's asleep. And they wake him up out of a good night's sleep because they're scared to death they're going to die in this storm. That's the only three places this fearful word is used. And as we continue, I want us to think about the question, the one that prompted this sermon today. Why is Jesus concerned about our being fearful? Why might <clears throat> our being fearful keep us out of God's kingdom? Well, we already have one example of how fear kept people out of God's kingdom. And the story's been given to us for us to learn from. Think 1 Corinthians 10. But let's go to Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. Numbers 13, verse 1. They're about... God, God has Israel about ready to enter the promised land. He's taught them all the law they need to have to be a free people. And now they're going to go into the land and live as God's kingdom of free men. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send you men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I will give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men who were heads of the children of Israel. Verse 17. And Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan, and he said to them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it's like. And the people that dwell there, are they strong or are they weak? Are they many or are they few? And what the land is that they dwell in? Is it a good land or is it a bad land? What are the cities like that they dwell in? Are they dwelling in tents or do they have walled cities? And what is the land? Whether is it fat or lean? Are there trees there for wood? And be you of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land, so that we can see. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob. And they ascended by the south and came into Hebron, where Ahiman and Sheshai and Tamai and the children of Anak were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. How many of us have searched out the land that we plan to inherit one day? How many feasts have we attended to look forward and think about the kingdom of God? <clears throat> How many prophecies have we read and sat around and talked about and speculated on what life's going to be like in the millennium and beyond? We too have searched out the land and found it to be a good land. They came to the brook Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bore it between two upon a staff. 
and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. And the place was called the brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes. Eshkol means in Hebrew a cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down from there. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran and to Kadesh. And they brought back word unto them and to all the congregation. And they showed them the wonderful fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came into the land where you sent us. And surely it is a land that flows with milk and honey. And here, look at the fruit of it. But, you know, there's always a but. Verse 28. Nevertheless, I hate to tell you this, but the people there, they are really strong people. In their cities, they're all walled up and they're really big. And we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites, they dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and Jebusites and Amorites, well, they dwell up in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. There's no place that isn't guarded by rough, tough men. Well, the Debbie Downers got done talking, and Caleb stood up and raised his arms, and he said, Don't listen to those guys. Let's go up at once and take the land, for we're well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, No, we're not. We can't go against these people. They're many times stronger than us. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched to the children of Israel, saying, It must have been politicians, because here were piled up beautiful fruits and vegetables and all this stuff. And over here they're saying, no, it's a horrible land. You don't want to go there. I don't know where that stuff came from. <laughs> the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. There were going to be great obstacles to overcome on the way to taking the kingdom. Israel was going to have to face their fears, trust in God, and move forward and take the land. Think about Mark 13, verses 9 through 12. There's a kingdom laid out in front of us. But we have an adversary that's worse than any giant from Anak. He doesn't want us to have that kingdom. Just as Israel had adversaries in front of them, we have adversaries in front of us. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the churches ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Now their brothers shall betray their brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Israel was being asked to face their fears, to face strong and evil men. men. Men who hated them and hated their God. But they were being asked to march forward and take the land anyway. We're being asked to do the same thing. Numbers 14 verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept all throughout the night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that God we had just died in the land of Egypt. 
or at least we could have died in the wilderness. But God has brought us all the way to this land. He's teasing us and showing us all this good stuff that we can't have. Because we're all going to die by the sword trying to go there. Is it not better for us to go ahead and just return to Egypt? Now think about yourselves, all of us. Where is our Egypt? They had a physical land to go to that was Egypt. In your mind, as you, we go forward, think about where is your Egypt? Where would you return to? If you ever said those words. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. So what changed? What changed between the grapes on the staff and verse 27 of Numbers 13? And now these verses, the first four verses of Numbers 14. Fear set in. Fear. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Je which were of them that searched the land, tore their clothing. And they spoke unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceedingly good land. The country we seek is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us. Notice it's the first place we've read in all of this so far where somebody's finally said, God will do this. He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear you the people of the land. For they are bred for us. Their defense, <clears throat> their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. And how do people often respond when they don't want to hear the convicting words that you're speaking to them? But all the congregation yelled out to stone them with stones. And who did Jesus say would turn on us? Who would betray us? These are their brothers and their sisters and their mothers and their fathers. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. I can't help it. I think about this. It's like I've been a bad boy and mom's chewing me out and I'm being rebellious and the door opens and there stands dad. You know, it's like, all right, dad comes down to the temple. <laughs> I'm here now. You all are in trouble. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? How long will it be before they believe me? For all the signs which I've showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of you, Moses, a greater nation and mightier than they. And we all know the end of the story. Those 40 and above, fear kept them out of the kingdom of God. Those below, they eventually went in. For fear, they died in the wilderness. Try to connect as we go on some of the things we say personally. Let them think about them. How do they apply to me? Consider again verses 8 and 9. Here the faith, of jo of faith and belief of Joshua and Caleb is juxtaposed against the fear of the people. Verse 8, it says, If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows in milk and honey. There's those promises. There's that belief. There's that faith. But then next is fear. 
don't rebel against the Lord. Rebellion fostered by unbelief and fear. Neither fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us. Don't fear them. Faith and belief, fear and unbelief. Hear what God says in verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people provoke me? Provokes a really strong word. A lot of negative connotation there. Pretty strong statement. But have you ever been in a situation, in a relationship, where time and time and time again, you have proven to somebody your word is good, they can depend upon you, you are there as you say you will be, and they still will not trust you, will not believe you, will not give you the benefit of the doubt. Well, magnify that a few million times, and that's God looking at Israel. God continues, And how long will it be before they believe me? For all the signs which I have shown them. Can God ask us the same question? All my adult life, <clears throat> since I've been driving a vehicle of some sort or another, God has never, ever left me helpless on the side of the road. Anywhere. I've had cars break down as I pulled into the driveway. I've had cars break down or motorcycle flat or any number of things. God's never left me without almost immediate help. And that's over, what, 40, 40 years of life at least. Three trips ago to Mississippi with a trailer load of bees behind the truck, we're about a mile from the bee yard. And all of a sudden, I don't know where the truck just stops. I mean, it doesn't come to a halt. I mean, it just, the engine quits. Nothing. And there's no houses around. I mean, we're just out in the middle of nowhere. But there were some old chicken houses right up here. And there was a place to pull in, so we were still coasting. I pulled in. Cranked the engine, nothing. Alethea gets on the phone. Well, the first thoughts to my mind, I say shamefully, God, why have you left me? Why have you left us out here in the middle of nowhere with the truck broken down? You never do that. So then I start, Aletha gets on the phone, her, her miniature computer, starts calling shops around Laurel and Ellisville. Oh yeah, we can get you in in a couple of weeks. Well, we've got 20 hives in the back of the truck full of bees. They've been locked up for 24 hours. God knew, see the week before, where it might have been that same trip. We had been on I-59 in the rain coming down so hard you couldn't see but one line at a time. Tornado warnings everywhere. Truck didn't break down there. Could have broke down the motel parking lot. I'd have felt a lot better at that point if that had happened. In fact, that's one of the things I'm thinking. But you know what? God knew exactly where that truck needed to break down. Because eventually, there were people there working the chicken yard. And they happened to have a nephew who was the best mechanic in Ellisville. And they happened to know the guy to call the tow truck to come and get the truck. And they happened to have space and a tractor to pull the truck out of the way to, unload the, to unhook the trailer where it could sit. And thanks to God organizing all of it, we were back with the truck running in less than three hours. 
and unloading these. Needless to say, this hard-headed Israelite had a lot of repenting to do. Well, <clears throat> fast forward two trips, one trip ago. This time it's a load of bees and supers of honey. And we come across a bridge. I've, or US 45 is not the best road in the state of Mississippi. And where the bridge and the road met, met was a big dip. And I didn't see it in time to go around it, so we hit that big dip at the speed limit. And Alethea said you couldn't see the trailer for the cloud of dust after it came loose from the truck. And I got it over to the side of the road. This time, because we were still out in the middle of nowhere, there's, there's nothing between Meridian and West Point. This time it was, thank you, God that we are safe, that the trailer hook stayed attached with the chains to the truck. I got us off the road, and we still have a load on that truck, on that trailer. You know what? I doubt it was more than three minutes before there was a young man standing next to me saying, do you need any help? Because he had seen us going the other way, and he dropped his trailer two or three times, and he felt sorry for us. And he turned around and came back to help. And thankfully he did because I took two jacks to get that trailer up, to get the tongue, the, the attachment all cleaned out and back on the truck so we could go down the road. Unfortunately, I've been praying for him ever since that God would bless him for his good work because a big semi came by, by and threw a big chunk of asphalt into the back window of his car and put a hole through the window. And that's what he got for helping us. So we have prayed God, take care of him, bless him because of him stopping to help us. How many times God says to us, do I have to show you? Hebrews 3, verse 6. Here Paul uses, I'm assuming it's Paul, uses the story of Israel to talk to us in modern times. Verse 6, we break into it. <clears throat> but Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are. If we hold fast the confidence that is our belief in God and the rejoicing of the hope that is our hope in the kingdom and our spiritual future, Firm to the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit says to us today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Don't allow fear to overcome your belief. Don't allow lack of belief to end up in fear. It's like a chicken and the egg. Which came first? Fear, unbelief, or unbelief and fear? It's either way. As in the provocation, the day of temptation in the wilderness, when I ask Israel to trust me with their lives, and they wouldn't do it. The day when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known <clears throat> they have not known my ways. So I swore my wrath that they would not enter into my rest or into my kingdom. So take heed, there are those words again, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, because unbelief leads to fear, and fear leads you to departing from the living God. Verse 15, so today if you will hear his voice, and don't allow fear to harden your hearts as in the provocation. Verse 19. Because as we have seen, they could not enter the kingdom because of unbelief and the fear that that fostered. The genesis of this sermon was a conversation I heard in oh, the last two or three months and others I've been a part of regarding the importance of standing for what we believe. 
And that could be any kind of, I'm not even necessarily a spiritual belief. And especially in this society that is governed more and more and more by the spirit of the age. It was noted in these conversations how few people will stand because they are hesitant to do so out of fear of the consequences for standing. It might cost me my job. It might cost me, I don't know, all my Twitter followers. It might cost me a relationship with a relative or whatever. Fear was preventing people from making a stand. Those conversations led me to think about what Jesus said to us in Revelation and to ask the questions, why? Why won't the fearful, the unbelieving you can sort of understand, but at the time I was not connecting the two, why won't the fearful and unbelieving inherit the kingdom? So we began in Mark 13 with the end time prophecy and asking ourselves, how will I respond to life-threatening persecution, to life-altering persecution. The story of Israel in the Promised Land gives us a real-life example of the fearful and the unbelieving not inheriting the kingdom. Is our belief strong enough to overcome our fear? Hebrews 11, <clears throat> Hebrews 11 verse 6. Many people quote Hebrews 11 verse 1 as the definition of faith. I've hung my hat on Romans 8:28 and I've hung my hat on Hebrews 11:6 and for me they work a lot better. Hebrews 11:6 Paul again says, without faith it is impossible to please him. Because we've seen that fearful and unbelieving are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. For without faith, it's impossible to please him. And by faith, I mean he that comes to God <clears throat> must believe that he is. Israel, if you go back to Numbers 14, 11, Israel never really believed that God is. They did on occasion when they saw the miracles. But deep down inside, they never really believed that God existed, that God was real. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He keeps his promises. And they never, ever really believed that he would or could reward them with the promises he has made. But if you're going to come to God, you've got to have those two things. Believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that seek him. But still I ask, why is it that the fearful and unbelieving cannot inherit the kingdom of God? And it may be an obvious answer to that in your minds by now. But in case it's not, when our lives are in danger, when we are in danger of having our life taken from us, when we are facing the possibility of great pain or suffering <coughs> inflicted upon us or someone we love very much, children, grandchildren, sons, daughters, and this is being inflicted upon us because of what we believe and then due to our lack of faith and lack of belief, as we've been talking about, fear sets in. That fear begets disobedience. That fear leads us to leaving God. Fearful and unbelieving humans will do anything to preserve their lives and keep them from suffering torment. And in our case, that would mean rejecting God rejecting beliefs that we know to be true and accepting someone else's authority over us in our lives. You know, lots of us have faced job loss over the Sabbath 
My dad lost countless jobs over the Sabbath and the holy days. We have faced life-threatening illnesses and diseases. John was talking about getting older and the aches and pains and things that come with that. Still others have lost homes to fires, to floods, to tornadoes. We lose businesses. We have losses of all kinds. We lose our parents, like my mom and dad. They're all difficult. They all try our faith, but they're not quite the same as facing down the loss of our life by someone else's hands because they're holding a gun pointing it at us, or loss of our freedom as in jail time. Just because what you believe differs from what the spirit of the age is teaching and promoting the society around us. I wonder if those days aren't coming upon us sooner than we realize and in our lifetimes. A time when we may be jailed or our lives in jeopardy because what we believe doesn't fit the narrative. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but with the spirit of the age, <clears throat> compliance has become the most noble virtue that a person can have. It's no longer trustworthiness, hard work, anything else. It's compliance. Will we comply? The last two and a half years we have been taught to comply. And in the minds of those led by the spirit of the age, you will comply. What will we do in the face of real persecution? in the face of fear. There's an organization recently created called Jane's Revenge. It is a militant, violent, pro-abortion organization prepared to seek revenge on anyone who would dare to stand against the idea of abortion. Now I know it's been a month or so since Roe v. Wade was overturned. And many of the threats I'm about to read to you have not yet been carried out. But there are a lot of state legislatures who still have yet to rule on what the abortion laws will be in their states. So there are lots of times for these things to come true. I know it's a little bit of a long letter, but I want to read this to you. This letter was printed in major newspapers across the country. Pardon me. <clears throat> And it's being, it's written by organizers of this group called Jane's Revenge. It says, you've seen that we are real, that we are not merely pushing empty words. As we said, we are not one group, but many. Where have you heard that phrase in the Bible before? You've seen us in Madison, Wisconsin, Fort Collins, Colorado, Riser Town, Massachusetts, Olympia, Washington, Des Moines, Iowa, Linwood, Washington, Washington, D.C., Asheville, North Carolina, Buffalo, New York, Hollywood, Florida, Vancouver, Washington, Frederick, Massachusetts, Denton, Texas, Gresham, Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, among others. And we work in countless locations invisibly. Those are all locations where pro-life organizations have had their offices either firebombed, uh, covered in graffiti, had other things done to their offices. And James Revenge has taken credit for those. <clears throat> They've given pro-abortion organizations 30 days to close their doors and cease operation before they were going to continue to do more and more violent damage to any pro-life group. So here they're saying, your 30 days expired yesterday. We offered an honorable way out. You could have walked away, but now the leash is off and we will make it as hard as possible for your campaign of oppression to continue. So it's a, it is oppressive to want to do away with abortion. We have demonstrated this in the past month how easy and fun it is to attack. We are versatile, we are mercurial, and we answer to no one but ourselves. 
we promise to take increasingly drastic measures against oppressive infrastructures. <clears throat> In other words, against pro-life organizations. Rest assured that we will and those measures may not come in the form of something so easily cleaned up as fire and graffiti. Sometimes you'll see what we do and you'll know it's us. Sometimes you think you were merely unlucky because you cannot see the ways in which we interfere in your affairs. But your pointless attempts to control others, that is by ruling against abortion, and, make, and making life more difficult, you will not be met passively. Eventually, your insurance companies and your financial back backers <clears throat> will realize you're a bad investment. Listen to this letter and think of yourself as someone who has donated money to a pro-life organization. This is being written to the organizations. How hard would it be to get the list of all the donors and their names and their addresses and go after them? Also, this is the way the Great Reset, those powers that be, are influencing a major reason we are not having any new oil drilling in this country is because bank, banks, fewer and fewer and fewer banks will loan money to an oil company if it's going to be used to drill oil. This is the way they are working. They don't need laws. They intimidate banks, lending institu or, um, insurance institutions, and so on. From here forward, any anti-choice group who closes their doors and stops operating will no longer be a target. But until you do, it is open season, and we know where your operations are. The infrastructure of the enslavers will not survive. We will never stop, back down, slow down, or retreat. We didn't want this, but it is upon us, so we must deal with it proportionally. We exist in confluence and solidarity with all others in the struggle for complete liberation. <clears throat> Our recourse now is to defend ourselves and build robust, caring communities of mutual aid <coughs> so we may heal ourselves without the need of the medical industry or any other intermediary. They're talking about giving aid to fellow abortionists and people get, having abortions and so on. The mind is totally twisted around backwards. Though attacking you, or through attacking you, we find joy and courage, and we strip away the veneer of impenetra impenetrability held by these violent institutions. And for the allies of ours who doubt the aut authenticity of the communiques and actions, there's one way you can get irrefutable proof that these actions are real. Go do, <clears throat> go do one of your own. You are, you, you are already one of us. Everyone with the urge to paint, to burn, to cut, to jam. Now is the time. Go forth and manifest the things you wish to see. Stay safe and practice your cursive. That's because they always sign Jane's Revenge in cursive print with their paint cans. This world is not anywhere near where it's going to be. But yet, there's no blowback against that letter. To my knowledge, I don't know if anybody's been arrested, maybe they have been, for any of the fire bombings or the other work against pro-life organizations. And I don't know how bad it's gonna get over the abortion issue. We all, we all are pro-life. We belong, members of a church organization that is pro-life. I don't know, but it points out we're moving in that direction. Do we believe that we can go from here into God's kingdom as disinterested bystanders? There's not going to be a Switzerland for those who just want to not take sides. Sooner or later, the God of this world, the spirit of this age, is going to make us care and make us take a stand. 
or comply. We like to think in the Bible about all those giant heroes like Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, Esther and the king. We read those stories, we marvel at those folks, and we think, I want to be like that. Don't forget the other stories in the Bible. Aaron, who built the golden calf out of fear of the people. Saul, who repeatedly disobeyed God out of fear of the people. Even Elijah ran from Jezebel out of fear for his life. Uncontrolled fear is a powerful motivator. And it almost always leads to bad results. One more time in Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must two things. Believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do I really down deep inside in the marrow of my bones believe that God is? Do I sometimes meditate and think about all the times that God has acted in my life to remind myself of how real God is? And do I believe, is there any doubt in my mind that when I die, God will reward me with a place in his spirit family and in his kingdom? As described in 1 John 3, verse 2, don't turn there. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. <clears throat> But it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. In conclusion, there's four scriptures left on your paper. Offer me a little bit of poetic license, I hope. Because I'm going to combine those four scriptures and read straight through with a little bit of added words. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Be not afraid of them, for after that they have no more that they can do to you. Only be you strong and very courageous, <clears throat> that you may observe to do all that God expects of you. And again I say, fear you not. Simply stand still and see the salvation of the Lord.